Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here so early this morning and under the rain. So um, I have an hour. This is a lot of time. So I suggest that we do it interactive and that you stop me whenever you have questions, things you, you, you want to discuss. Uh, I know that um, there are, there are mathematicians and people that might not be biologists, so don't hesitate to, to, to make it uh, alive. And if I don't finish, I, I don't mind, so I can stop whenever time is over. So um, I'm Anna-Marie Lennon Dumenil, as it was said, and I work in the Curie Institute. I've been there for, for uh, now 13 years, I think. Uh, I have my own lab there and uh, I work at the interface between uh, immunology and cell biology and more lately I also started to actively collaborating with physicists and today I'll, I'll tell you a story where there will be essentially cell biology and biophysics. No immunology except this slide, first slide, just to introduce you the cells I work on. Uh, I like them very much but don't be stressed, uh, there will be no no CD, no uh, fax plots, nothing too complicated. So those cells are dendritic cells. They're very important for your immune system to work properly. Uh, they are in the peripher peripheral tissue. So those are the tissues that uh, are often exposed to a microbial attack, for example, the skin or the mucosa. And their role there is to patch all the tissue. Um, and this they do because they have this capacity to engulf very large amount of extracellular material. This is important. We're going to get back to this during the entire talk. And they do that because they do macropinocytosis. So macropinocytosis is an act-independent process that allows cells to make giant vesicles above uh, 2 to 300 nanometers and to engulf in these vesicles mat extracellular material in a non-specific manner. There's no need to engage receptors or something like that. Okay, so this is very specific of the immature dendritic cells that patrol tissues, they uh, have a very high micropinocytic capacity. They stay in the tissue because at that stage they don't express CCR7. And CCR7 is a chemokine receptor that drives them to lymph node when they become mature. So when do they become mature? When they find a microbe. When they find something that tells them hey, there's uh, an intruder in, 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 in the body, so we have to get rid of them. So then they, they engulf this microbe, whatever it is, a bacteria, a parasite, a, a fragment from an infected cell with a virus. And then they upregulate this molecule, CCR7, and this makes them recognize a gradient of the chemokine CCL21 that drives them towards the lymphatic vessel. And then they take the lymphatic vessels and they go to lymph node. When they arrive in lymph node, they are mature. We call them mature. That means that now they don't uptake macro extracellular material anymore. Actually, macropinocytosis is completely shut down at that stage. And they completely dedicate their, their, their function, their time, to interact with the T lymphocyte and present whatever fragment of the microbe they have engulfed in the peripheral tissue. Okay? And this is the first step of any adaptive immune response. Without this, uh, organisms cannot mount specific immune responses. There are kids that do not have uh, antigen presentation molecules, and then they have to, to live in bubbles. They're immuno severely immunodepressed. So um, to recapitulate, we have immature dendritic cells that are in the tissue. They do patrolling. And this is thanks to macropinocytosis, engulfment of extracellular material. When they mature, they find a microbe, they arrive to lymph node, and then they stop engulfing material and they present whatever they have found there to the T lymphocyte, and this starts the immune response. So, first, uh, f first uh, slide, it's, I, I, I think, the only immunology <laughs> we'll get in the talk. Um, so, what uh, am I been doing? Um, as I said, uh, these different stages in the life of dendritic cells have been uh, associated in vivo to different modes of migration. So this is thanks to experiments of intravital microscopy. So people have been able to uh, visualize dendritic cells when they are in the tissues 
and uh, when they are either searching for antigen or when they are in the lymph node interacting with T cells. And what they've seen is that when they are patrolling the tissue, they seem to uh, harbor a random-like migration behavior. Whereas they become very directional once they find a microbe and they recognize the CCL21 gradient. And finally, when they are in lymph node, they're rather sessile when they are interacting with T cells. So in my lab, we've been trying to understand the molecular basis for this distinct migration mode. How can we explain at the molecular scale these large scale migratory behaviors of dendritic cells? Is this only about the chemokines and the cues that are present in the tissue? Or are there some cell autonomous, cell intrinsic mechanisms that makes the dendritic cell migrate in these different manners? So this has been what we've been uh, working on for, for now more than 10 years. And uh, the approach we've been undertaking is bottom up. So ideally we would go in vivo. The problem with in vivo imaging is that it's not resolutive enough to see what's going on inside of the cell. So this is why we chose to rather take this approach. So what we do is that we prepare the dendritic cell from the bone marrow of mice, and we have mice that are knockout, knock in, etc., as you will see. Then we use microfabricated devices to try to reproduce the environment of the dendritic cells in tissue. For example, a key parameter, as you will see later, is confinement. And uh, we, from this, we isolate the specific properties of dendritic cell migration. We uh, unravel the underlying mechanism. And finally, we go back to the tissue to evaluate uh, the impact of our findings on the physiology of the cells in their natural environment. And this is a device we've been using extensively. As I said, we show that confinement is key for dendritic cell to move. So basically, if you prepare dendritic cells and you put them on 2D, they don't move at all. Okay. If you come with a roof on top of them or you put them in a confined channel, then they start moving actively. And this is because they reproduce, these devices reproduce the confinement uh, in which they are used to move in, in vivo. In vivo, they move in between cells, in between matrix, in between um, vessels, uh, etc. But most of the time, they don't move, I mean, probably never in two dimensions. So using this device, which are channels in which dendritic cells are confined, they're made of plastic and one side is just glass, and we coat them with whatever we want. The beauty of, of, of this device is, is, is that it's very simple. We don't need to add extracellular chemokines or things like that that would bias our result. The cells are introduced into the portals and then we time-lapse them. Uh, they look like this, little, little snails uh, that move forward in this particular movie. The, the, the nuclei have been labeled in blue, but we can label whatever we want and do automatic analysis. So it's very quantitative. So we've done quite a lot uh, on this, on dendritic cells, both the biology, the cell, basic cell biology, also some immunology and um, some physics. We've also started to collaborate with other people uh, to use it for T cells and more lately on cancer cell. But today I'll be only talking uh, on dendritic cell. So, one of the interesting findings we made is that when the dendritic cells become mature, so they become activated uh, as in the tissue, and this we can uh, manage just by treating the cells. So the ED IDC means immature dendritic cells. So I remind you, those are the cells that are in the tissue and that are patrolling their environment by doing macropinocytosis. And LPSDC, those are the mature cells. So we just treat them with a little bit of LPS. This is a bacterial compound that mimic uh, the encounter between a dendritic cells and a real bacteria. And one observation we made is that when we do this, the speed of the cells increases. This is intrinsic. These are cells in the microchannel. So they become faster. If we put them in 2D confined by bringing a, a roof on top of them, we can also observe that they become more persistent. So they move in a more directional manner. So they become faster and more persistent when they get activated. And if we now use dendritic cells that, we, uh, that are made from a mouse that express 
uh, live 5 GFP, so this allows us to, to monitor the dynamic of, of, of uh, f actin. Uh, what we can observe is that this is associated to different uh, distribution profiles of actin. So this is a little cell race, the first one I'll show in, in, this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, it, as you can see here, if you have good eyes, immature DCs have most of actin at their very front around these giant vesicles. Those are the micropinosomes. I will show them be better in the next slide. <coughs> the mature cells are faster and more directional. However, uh, their actin is not at the front anymore. It's r rather towards the, their, their back. And you can see it better on those movies. So in mature cells, most of actin at the front around the giant micropinosome. And in mature cells, I'm sorry because it's very, very... There's a lot of light, so you cannot see the border of the cell. But uh, I, I, no, I think it's the light intrinsic of the projector, but no, it no. doesn't matter. And uh, so this, this uh, structure of acting is rather located at, towards the back. It's just behind the nucleus. And it's made of, uh, it's cortical, it's made of actin bundles. So I will make a long story short. This was published, the reference is somewhere there. I can't see it, sorry. <laughs> it's there, you see it. Maybe. Push the button to the right of what you're pushing down. Oh, okay. So don't fall asleep. <laughs> so um, to make a long story short, what we showed is that this uh, difference in actin distribution uh, corresponds actually to a s switch between different actin nucleators. So the immature cell, they make this giant actin uh, coated vesicles thanks to ARP23 which you've heard yesterday, is essential for the generation of branched actin network. And this is needed for macropinocytosis. The, um, let's say, originality of our finding was that we found that this is absolutely not required for migration. Okay, ARP23 makes macropinocytosis, but if we remove ARP23, we have the cell accelerating. So ARP23 and branch actin are not needed for migration in this system. They're needed for macropinocytosis and the event limits migration, probably because they, they form macropinosomes. That uh, we can discuss later. What is used as actin structure for migration is this very weird structure, which is rather at the back of the cell. And it's nucleated by formins, and in particular by one formin, which is MDR1. And this is used for fast migration. However, it has a negative effect on macropinocytosis. So it seems to be a dialogue between ARP23 and uh, formins in the system, which probably could be competition for monomer. I, it was shown in other systems by, by the group of uh, uh, David Cover. So importantly, this switch in actin nucleators and this switch in, uh, from slow and random to fast and persistent migration <coughs> is needed for dendritic cells to efficiently reach lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes. So if we prevent this switch, the cells uh, uh, are not directionally enough uh, in, in, uh, while getting into the lymphatic vessels and they're really delayed, it takes them several days to make it to the lymph node. I'm not showing the data for sake of time. So uh, this is needed uh, for uh, the impact, the, the migration, efficient migration of dendritic cells in vivo. So what I'm, oh yes, I put this slide for physicists that are in this room, just to maybe to discuss why ARP23 is not required in this system for migration, whereas it has always been thought to be required. So this comes from uh, the difference between the 2D and the confinement. In 2D, cells move using adhesion. And for this, they need to have ARP23 that makes the lamellipodia at the front, okay, and that allows them uh, to generate forces that are parallel to the substrate. In this system, the forces are not there anymore. This is a system of migration which is adhesion independent, and uh, in this system, uh, the, the, the forward movement results from a pressure gradient that uh, itself results from some forces that are exerted by the cells perpendicularly to the substrate. And what we think and what our results suggest is that those forces, they're not generated by ARP23, but they are rather generated by for this form-independent actin network that I showed you in the previous slide.
Okay, so this is a summary of the first part. Immature cells, mature cells, immature cells, they patrol, they do macropinocytosis and they have slow random migration. Thanks to ARP2-3 that is at their front and allow them to build those micropinosomes. When they become mature, ARP2-3 is downregulated. There's no more micropinocytosis and the migration becomes fast and persistent and essentially depends on forming. And this is needed for them to reach the lymphatic vessels and start the immune response. So today, this is published. Today I will show you a new story which is uh, submitted right now. And uh, this story uh, is on the role of macropinocytosis on sensing of hydraulic pressure, hydraulic resistance. It's uh, completely, completely new. It's one of the first time I present it. So if I'm not clear, please don't hesitate to um, <coughs> interrupt me and ask all the questions you want. Okay, before getting into the subject, I need to introduce you to what is barotaxis? Barotaxis is a concept that was uh, proposed some years ago in 2013 by the group of Irimia and, and Shah at, at Harvard. So what they found is that these cells, HL60, with, which is a neutrophil-like cell line, which is a really broad model for migration of non-adhesive cell, um, they are able to sense hydraulic resistance uh, in the extracellular milieu and to respond by choosing the low resistant path. So in this, so the, this, the, in blue you have the cell. It's coming through this channel and it's finding a bifurcation. It's a T bifurcation in their microfluidic device. If the device is symmetric, they, they have 50% of chances to choose the left or the right arm. If you increase pressure, hydraulic resistance, by changing, increasing the length or diminishing the width of one arm, what you observe is that the cells are biased towards the low resistant arm. Okay? And the extreme situation is this dead end, where one of the channels has been closed, so here hydraulic resistance is infinite. In that case, what they found is that almost all the cells take the low resistant path. And uh, their conclusion was like, uh, these cells, neutrophil, they sense pressure and uh, they prefer to go to, uh, to, to paths where pressure, hydraulic pressure is rather, is rather low. So why do we think that this is important? As I said, in vivo, cells very often are confined. They're confined in tissue and in, in particular in the interstitial space of tissue when they are in between cells or in between matrix. They're also very, uh, very often confined in, uh, in, in networks of vessels. So for example, in the lymphatic networks, this is a picture of the lymphatic networks of the, the ear of the mouse. And you can see that there's very small vessels sometimes and there are also lots of dead ends. So what suggests that those uh, vessels could, be, could display very high pressure. In addition, cells very often move in the liver, in the lung, in the brain, in capillaries. So there, if you look at them in vivo, moving in vivo, there are some intravital imaging movies that show that they are completely confined. They look very similarly to the cells that move in the microchannel. So we think that um, it's likely that they are uh, um, uh, places uh, of variable hydraulic resistance in tissue and that hydraulic resistance is probably a major obstacle that cells have to face while moving from one tissue to another. In addition, there are situations, yes? So when, you, uh, when I understand there is a difference of pressure between the back yes. and the front, but it's not this difference of pressure is pushing them, so mechanically pushing them? No, this is not what we are uh, uh, addressing here, no. No, it, it, it basically does not. No, it does not. It does not. No, it does absolutely not. So there's also uh, cases, yes? In this, in a network like mm -hmm. that, is there an overall directionality? I mean, it seems kind of random. It's not known. Okay. Probably. Uh, so what has been shown is that depend, the, the dependent, there's a gradient of chemokine, even though it has not been uh, characterized 
in the network itself, because it's very complex to detect gradients of chemokine. And the people that have m managed to uh, image cells that are migrating with the lymphatics, what they see is that the cells do three, the, let's say, three steps on a side and two on the other. Three on, and at the end, they, they, they end moving, end up moving toward one side. But it's not clear at all how cells move within such network because it's very difficult to, to visualize experimentally. So there's also another situation where it's very clear that uh, uh, hydraulic resistance increase, and this is when you have inflammation and you have an edema. So in that case, the, 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 the fluid is not flowing out from the tissue and uh, the hydraulic pressure, pressure increases. This, this has been really measured experimentally. And of course, this is important for immune cells to be uh, recruited and to, to perform their job. So very often edema and, and inflammation are associated to sites of infections and uh, immune cells need to be there. So our hypothesis is the following. This is an HL60 cells. I just showed you that this cell is barotactic. Here it's moving within a channel where the fluid is red and the cell is green. So these cells, as you can see, does not do macropinocytosis. And this is very, very different from a dendritic cell, which is moving within a channel, but it's engulfing at the front extracellular fluid through macropinocytosis. So here comes our hypothesis. Because this cell is, does not have to push fluid, but rather engulfs fluid and releases it at the back, could this cell, because it's micropinocytic, not be sensitive to hydraulic resistance. So because fluid can go through these cells, thanks to the macropinocytosis process, maybe these cells that do not sense, does not feel the hydraulic resistance of the uh, milieu. And uh, this, uh, what we had in mind, is that could help them exploring dead ends. So exploring places where other cells that are sensitive to pressure cannot go because <coughs> the resistance is too high, and maybe this could contribute to their capacity to patch all the tissue in search for some microbe or other uh, danger-associated particles. Okay, are we clear on this? Because I think this is the most <laughs> important hypothesis, so we need to be clear for me to move forward. Okay, no question here. Good. So to address this question, uh, we made our own device. We chose to have why bifurcation instead of T bifurcations, because we think that we've observed that when dendritic cells move in tissue, in particular in the skin, this is the type of bifurcation they're facing very often. Okay, they, they, the Y-like, Y-shaped uh, bifurcation. We increase pressure in one arm, so either they're symmetric, like here, either pressure is increased in one arm by uh, modifying the length or the width. And uh, these are the results of uh, the first experiments we did just to validate the system. So these are HL60 cells. As, as it was shown, we found that in symmetric devices, both HL60 cells as well as dendritic cells choose the arms, any, either the left or right arms, in a random manner. But when pressure increases, uh, now the bias is towards the low uh, resistant arm. Uh, the, the, here what is graphed is the bias. So uh, basically in that particular case, uh, what you have is that uh, about uh, when you have a dead end, uh, 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of the cells are choosing the low resistant path. It's less than in, in, what in the study that was previously published, we think probably because the device is not exactly the same. Yeah. Yes. These are the mature, yes? No, these are, these are the immature. So the immature cells... No, those are the neutrophil that were previously published to do the barotaxis. Okay. But you're right, they are like the mature because they don't do micropinocytosis. Okay. We'll get to the mature dendritic cells at the very end of the talk. Those are, when I, uh, uh, those are just the immature cells, uh, but they are in a condition when they don't do the macropinocytosis. I will explain you why just after. And uh, in that case, we see that they are barotactic as well. Uh, although uh, maybe they're, they, they're less, uh, less 
um, able to sense uh, low differences in pressure as compared to the to the neutrophil. But if if they are in front of the dead end, similarly to the neutrophil, you can see that about 75 percent of the cells are rather choosing the low resistant path. So this is just validation of our system. Now. Uh, we're going to now manipulate macropinocytosis in immature dendritic cells uh, to uh, try to address our hypothesis that macropinocytosis renders them um, insensitive to pressure. Yes. But if they constantly engulf a lot yes. of uh, yes. uh, liquid, it should go out, otherwise it will slow. They will slow. It does go out. We've shown this in a previous paper. So uh, it, go it does go out about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, it's exposed uh, towards the side of the cell um, when, where the nucleus is. So oh, okay. if not, the cells would, you know, they need to recycle the membrane. They also need to maintain the volume constant. So they're uptaking the fluid and they're releasing it. So exocytosis seems to be associated often to macropinocytosis. These other people have, have shown this. Uh, other, whether there are other mechanisms such as channels, aquaporins, it's not excluded. Uh, we don't know this at that stage. So uh, the cell... Step related to the propulsion, <coughs> getting rid of the water. You know, because I, I think yes. mixobacter... Yeah. Yeah, it makes... It. Yes. I don't think, in our hands, uh, we don't have good experiment to invalidate or validate this hypothesis. What we know is that each time we block macropinocytosis, so there's no more, uh, neither uptake, neither uh, secretion of, of fluid, uh, the cell rather accelerates. So I don't think this is the basic mechanism that is used by these cells to move. However, it could contribute in some particular situation. I cannot exclude this. Uh, protein, protein get in. Sorry? Protein. Getting in by Proteins? Yes. So everything gets yes. in. Right. Yes, yes, proteins get yes. in. Right. And we've shown that yeah. in the process of, of uh, secreting, <laughs> some of the protein remain in the cells and reach the, the late endosomal compartment. So the cells I just showed you, that is barotactic and that com behaves similarly to the neutrophil, is this cell. Uh, this is a cell that is in a very small channel section, so small that these cells, I I although it is an immature cell, it cannot handle macropinocytosis because all the acting in this cell, it's used for, mi for, for migration. It's at the back of the cell, this is life act, it's concentrated at the back and it's used for migration. We now know that this is when the nucleus is very confined, uh, the, 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 the forces that the cell have to exert to move the nucleus forward are so high that all the, 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 the actin is dedicated for migration. Okay. In general, we always see this competition for actin and for actin binding protein between the front and the back and which depends on the degree of confinement. So this is the cell that I just show you which is barotactic. To a low migration, to a low macropinocytosis, we need to increase a little bit the size of the channel. So in that case, we have a channel which is, uh, uh, which allows, which is compatible for actin recruitment at the front. And in that case, macropinocytosis occur. This probably also uh, is true in vivo. We have some now in vivo imaging that suggests that when the cell is too confined in vivo, it stops doing macropinocytosis. Okay, so. I'm going to uh, discuss the results just in the context of these two devices, the symmetric one or the one where one arm is open and one arm is closed. This is the behavior of the cells that are immature cells that are barotactic in the small channel. So here macropinocytosis is off. But as I, I just showed you, those cells, they're biased. About close to 8% of the 80% of the cells go to the low resistant path. If we now increase the section of the channel and we have cells that do macropinocytosis, the bias is completely lost. Actually, now those dendritic cells are not able to recognize between open and uh, a closed arm. Okay? They choose uh, one or the other in a random manner. So this is how they behave the cells that is choosing the open end. And this is how behave the cell that is choosing the uh, dead end. So do you see that the front is very active and that the cell, let me see if I can play this again. Yes. So the cell that choose the open end and the cell that choose the closed end. Very active front and 
lots of macropinosomes that are being made there. I'll come back later to this uh, for some quantification. So this suggests that maybe our hypothesis that efficient fluid transport through macropinocytosis enable immature cells to explore the dent might be true. Okay, but should the cell on the left have the actin at the rear? So the, uh, in, in the normal cells, when they're doing macropinocytosis because the channels are, are large enough, uh, the actin shuffles between the back and the rear. Okay, so it depends at which stage you, you, you catch it. So this cell does macropinocytosis, but when it's in the open end, it's not active doing, uh, as active doing macropinocytosis. It does less. I will show you that later. Yes, Tony. I'm resistant to connect this with in vivo, because I'm trying to understand when in vivo you actually have this very biased condition of confinement, yes. right? Yes. In my talk, I presented a movie where we had, were looking at cells that were also going through a highly confined mm -hmm. space. And this happened to be cells that were actually going through the through the endothelium of the capillary. Yes, right? that's, that could be one case, there, yes. Um, sort of the effect was the opposite in the sense that the leading part of the cell, I didn't discuss mm -hmm. that, but the leading part of the cell actually was gaining surface area. It's exactly the opposite of this. Right? Well, why is the opposite? Because here you're having the pinocytosis in the leading Yes, front. but when the, the cell makes the pinocytosis, it also extends the front. Ex well, um, so we were measuring the volume of the cell mm -hmm. and the surface area of the mm -hmm. cell, right? Yeah. So what happened was that you, the cell is migrating yeah. and has a essentially constant volume, constant surface area. As it starts to go through the highly confined space, mm -hmm. you know, through the wall of the endothelium, um, the volume remains, the surface area, if you wish, of the back of the cell remains, quote, constant, right? I mean, it gets corrected by the fact that you're moving. Mm -hmm. The front is a massive explosion of membrane, right? That's and the only way I can interpret that is that you are activating exocytosis, right? You have to bring membrane. And the total area of the cell also increased dramatically, It's right? not a bad. No. So is it no. your job? Yes, I if beg you, your pardon? If you want to do that, if you decrease the volume, you have to increase the area. No, no, the volume is constant. No, exactly, but because we, no, we change the shape, become more narrow, this, no. we have to gain an area. It's a pure geometry. No, no. The, the, mm -hmm. This is, and this is an actual, it, this is not the geometry of... No, it's, heaven, it's implemented biologically, but it's forced by geometry. The, uh, there is a dramatic increase of surface area, and it's actually addition of membrane going on. No, it's but not exactly. just if you squeeze it by factor of two, you have a, by certain factors, like a small increase in the area. Right, but the problem... I suggest that we leave this discussion for after, but I'm, I would be happy, Tommy, you show me this. I can show you some dendritic cells that are also transmigrating, so growing th through the the uh, uh, basement membrane that could be similar to an endothelium in, in the gut, and, and we might see something like this. I think this is different from this. This is, in that case, cells are facing hydraulic resistance. When they go through a, a membrane or an endothelium, I don't think they necessarily face higher hydraulic resistance, maybe in some cases, but not a lot of them. Anyhow, we will come back to the in vivo situation later on. Okay, so um, to really... Uh, say that the hypothesis is true, we need, of course, to further manipulate macropinocytosis. And we did it by different means. Here we inhibit macropinocytosis as much as we can inhibit it. Um, and there's no very good inhibitor of macropinocytosis, but here are two of them. We also did two additional one or two, three inhibition and CDC42. This one uh, is amyloride. It inhibits NHE1. Rotlerin is not really clear, but it's also inhibiting the ionic exchange. Both uh, are, are shown to inhibit macropinocytosis, and you can see that they have no effect in the small channels where uh, the macropinocytosis is off. They don't affect the bias. However, they uh, restore barotaxis when cells are treated uh, in the higher channel when macropinocytosis is on. So this is telling that uh, when dendritic cells are doing macropinocytosis, we block macropinocytosis. Now they become sensitive to hydraulic resistance again. We uh, also have a mutant, so we've previously shown, reference should be somewhere there, uh, that uh, this uh, protein, which is associated to MHC molecules, uh, controls the macropinocytic capacity. So macropinocytosis is decreased in uh, 
uh, dendritic cells that are knockout for this uh, protein invariant chain. It's also named CD74. But I said I shouldn't mention any CD in my talk, so it's no good. And uh, the result is the same then for inhibition. In that case, uh, we uh, restore barotaxis, so the cells become again sensitive to hydraulic resistance when we use the knockout for this protein uh, in the big channels. There's no effect in the small uh, channel once again. So there's a natural way of inhibiting macropinocytosis. I started my talk with this, uh, which is uh, just letting the cells mature. So we treat them with LPS. We know that the macropinosomes, they're gone, and now the cells fully dedicated to migration. So we did the experiments, we treated the cells with LPS, so in that case now we have mature dendritic cells and uh, as you can see in the big channels, immature dendritic cells, they don't sense pressure. However, mature dendritic cells do sense pressure and they preferentially choose the low resistance pass as do the non-macropinocytic neutrophil. We have a mutant, uh, that's down-regulation of macropinocytosis in mature cells does not occur as efficiently. Uh, this is this mutant, catepsin S. In that case, uh, we do not restore the bias. So if macropinocytosis is not down-regulated in mature dendritic cells, they're not able to sense pressure and to choose the low-resistant path. So altogether, this is showing that when we manipulate macropinocytosis, we systematically find that macropinocytic cells Choose low resist, uh, are not uh, sensing hydraulic resistance, whereas non macropinocytic cells preferentially choose low resistant paths. So it's strongly suggesting that macropinocytosis renders immature dendritic cells insensitive to hydraulic resistance. And I'll come back to the movie. Uh, as I said, this cell which is choosing the dead end is uh, very active. This is something we uh, systematically uh, uh, um, observe. So we wanted to, to, to test the hypothesis of whether the increase in hydraulic resistance is upregulating, is inducing the macropinocytic process itself. And we tested this just by uh, measuring uh, different aspects uh, of uh, uh, different parameters in the cells that were uh, before or after the dead end. So what we found is that uh, when the cell chooses the open end, it doesn't change velocity. So it arrives towards the bifurcation, it chooses the uh, open end and it is moving at the same speed. However, when it chooses the dead end, it really slows down when it's migrating in the dead end. And this is uh, something that is compatible with what we have previously shown on macropinocytosis. Uh, the cells always slow down when they're doing the mac macropinocytosis. We didn't manage to <laughs> measure macropinocytosis itself because the cells, when they get there, they have already engulfed a lot of material. So it was the data were very messy, but um, we measure the rate of protrusion retraction at the front and the rate of actin accumulation. Our work for many years has shown that most of the time, uh, the macro, I mean, all the time, macropinocytosis rate is proportional to these two parameters. And we found that when the cells get into the dead ends, they really have a very high rate of protrusion retraction of the entire cell front. And uh, there's a lot of actin that is accumulating there. We, interestingly, we also found that very often the cells that will choose the dead end uh, have already uh, a lot of acting at the front, which suggests that maybe the cells that are doing already a lot of macropinocytosis before the choice comes to them uh, are preferentially choosing the dead end uh, as compared to the other cells. Yes? Could you say something about the dimensions um, of, of the your microfluidic channels and the in vivo uh, channels because you show yes. in the microfluidic device that the mm -hmm. cell effectively fills up the channel. So there is so in vivo it will it will have to basically yes. remove all the fluid. liquid, yes. otherwise it will build up yes. the pressure. Yes. Is this the same in vivo? I mean yes. the so there's no good pressure the pressure measurement in vivo. But we've we chose our, the size of the channel based on uh, in vivo experiments uh, in, of many people, not only us, but many people. Uh, in the skin, for example, cells in vivo, they are confined and uh, the size is compatible with uh, these channels. In uh, some vessels as well, and small vessels, small capillaries in the skins and also in other tissue, 
the sizes are also very similar to the one of the channel. They can go very, very low. I mean, they can be uh, uh, less than two micron. So, so the could pass by the but the, you have the whole the whole range. No, if the liquid passes through the cell, I mean, there's a little bit of liquid that passes through the cell. This is why we don't obtain 100% of cells that low, go to the low resistant path. But if it's completely passing completely, of course, then it makes no sense. It does not apply. Confinement is key for for this hypothesis. More questions? <laughs> I'm just a bit confused. Uh, yeah. uh, couldn't this uh, be explained just by the resistance, so the just physical forces? Uh, I, I'm going to get to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. When they reach the dead end, what do they do? So it's variable. Some cells stay there and try to insist, you know, to see whether they can go further, and other cells just turn around and come back. So we haven't quantified that properly. Maybe there would be something interesting. Okay, so I think uh, I, I, I've, we've shown so far that macropinocytosis, uh, all experimental evidence suggests that macropinocytosis overcomes barotaxis. And uh, in addition, this latest experiment also suggests that macropinocytosis can be increased when hydraulic resistance increases. So, uh, of course, for us, the key question, as I said at the very beginning, is that could that influence uh, the behavior of the dendritic cells in the tissue? And in, particularly, in particular, could this help them exploring uh, dead ends? Um, so we, we did an experiment to uh, provide some answer to this question. I don't think it's uh, definitive, but I, I think it's rather interesting. So we built a mouse that has half of the cell of dendritic cells that are in one color and do macropinocytosis, and the other half, they're knockout for this protein in varian chain that I mentioned above, uh, be before, and that uh, reduce their macropinocytic capacity. We put them in the, and we then we image by a two photon microscopy the behavior of these cells in uh, the dermis of the ear, so those mice, they're, uh, they're imaged by intravital microscopy in the dermis. So you can see that both cells have colonized, cell types have colonized the, the dermis, and uh, we did not, or we did induce an edema. So what we observe is that in the mouse dermis, in the absence of edema, the two cells behave quite, the two cell types behave quite similarly. Even though there is a tendency for uh, 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 the, the um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the colors are super, or there's a problem with the colors, I, I, sorry for this. So this is the knockout, the yellow is the knockout cell and the green is the wild type cell. And um, what we found is that if we now induce an edema and we calculate the exploration of the space by the two different cell types, we observe that the wild type cells the here in green, I don't know why they should be red, <laughs> uh, are better exploring their space. It means that uh, within the length of the movie, the cells are uh, uh, having a better coverage of the tissue than the knockout cells. So we need, uh, we've done many experiments, this is robust. Uh, what we haven't been able to uh, measure so far is macropinocytosis at the same time. It's for some technical issue. When we inject the liquid, we have it everywhere and we cannot measure what is getting inside of the cell, which would be really the definitive answer that shows that the less macropinocytic cells are less able to explore the edema. Do you distinguish exploration versus motility? Yes, because uh, we also measure the speed of the cell and the tendency is that the knockout cells, they go faster, which is compatible with uh, the fact that they don't do macropinocytosis. We always should found that when there's no macropinocytosis, cells go faster. So this is not due to motility. Even if those cells go faster, they explore less. Okay. So um, I, this is the take-home message of the first part, I'm, oh, so I will not have a lot of time to, to talk about the theory, it doesn't matter. Uh, um, first, macropinocytosis overcomes barotaxis. Second, macropinocytosis is induced by hydraulic pressure. Third, it might facilitate the exploration of space by immature dendritic cells and by uh, macropinocytic cells in general, maybe. Okay. Just uh, 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 a thought, uh, I mean, I would like to mention that cancer cells are macropinocytic. Uh, you will hear Daphna Borsaghi on Friday that will be talking about this. 
She's not coming. No, oh, no, how sad. A storm. Oh, how sad. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, she, she showed that uh, this really provides them an advantage. She had shown that the advantage is rather, I mean, she has studied it for, for metabolism because it brings them all the protein they need to produce amino acids and to survive. But uh, what we would like to explore, and we've been discussing actually with her, is whether this could also help them maybe hiding in some places, in some dead ends, with other non macropinocytic cells can go. So could this modify the migratory behavior of cancer cells in vivo? It's something we would like to address. So finally, I'm going to talk very briefly, and I'm sorry, Patrice, I have only 10 to 15 minutes uh, about uh, how barotaxis work. So please let me first tell you why barotaxis and in general hydraulic resistance as a force, as an obstacle for cells in tissue was not considered so much so far. The reason was that if you measure uh, the uh, uh, cell forces uh, on adhesive pattern, so for cells in 2D, for example, by traction force microscopy, you find forces that are in the kilopascal range. But if you now measure, and this is the work of Eva Paluche, the forces of cells that are confined, okay, and this is the situation where most of cells uh, are in tissue, at least immune cells, which do not use adhesion, but rather friction to move, they're rather in the range of the Pascal. These values are compatible with the differences in hydraulic resistance, which are found in tissues, which are also in the range of the Pascal. Whereas these values are not. If cells would exert such forces when they would be in tissue, they wouldn't care about uh, hydraulic resistance. They would still be able to move forward. So we think that the friction forces are compatible with pressure sensing. And this comes back to your question. In that sense, we don't need maybe active mechanism, receptor signaling pathway, etc., as it was suggested initially in the PNAS barotaxis paper. Maybe barotaxis is just the result of an opposing force that is exerted towards the cells and it prevents it from moving forward. And this is the hypothesis we wanted to test. And for this, we uh, build a model. Uh, the model was made by um, Raphael Voiturier and Carles uh, Blanc Mercader and Jean-François Joanny, so active gel theory. Don't ask me too much about the model because I will explain you what I understand, but what I don't explain is what I <laughs> don't understand. So basically, in the model cells are considered as a proelastic gel. Uh, the motion entails friction forces. Uh, and uh, the key parameters are actin input, actin depolymerization and polymerization, contractility, and of course permeation. Permeation is what uh, the parameter that was used in the model to mimic the macropinocytosis, so fluid going through the cell. And uh, the output are cell direction bias, cell behavior, actin distribution, and time. So this is a simulated cell in a symmetric bifurcation. Uh, this is what we ex obtain from the model. So the cell is in front of the bifurcation and it's extending the two arm symmetrically. Then there's a spontaneous polarization of the system, but that occurs uh, at a critical length of the arms, but where the difference between the two arms is very, very low. And I think this is what <laughs> took me a lot of time to understand. If somebody has a pen, I can explain it the way the physicists explain it to me. Then in this, in this polar when this polarization occurs, the actin uh, accumulates in the losing arm and makes it retract. And therefore, the, chase, the cell chooses uh, the uh, opposite uh, direction. And the, um, so this is just showing that when the arm uh, here in, in pink retracts, so uh, reduces its size, whereas the other one keeps increasing, the difference between the length between two, the two arms is very low. So uh, the idea is that this system uh, self-amplifies as a result of the property of the actomyosin network. So maybe if you show me a pen. So I, I couldn't understand this. I was uh, asking Rafael, but why the two arm extends? Maybe one feels a mechanical load, so it extends less. and no. So the two arms extend the same way, but then <laughs> there's a very, so in an ideal system, this pen, I would put it and it would never fall. But when I put it, 
it does fall, okay? And this is because there was a very small difference that was amplified and that led to a black or white output. Patricia, am I, am I saying it well? <laughs> so um, this is uh, in intrinsic of the actomyosin uh, property of the actomyosin system, which leads to this amplification of this very small difference between the length of the two arms uh, towards a black or white response. The arm retracts and it chooses the low resistant path. And uh, this is the, the real cell. It's in a symmetric bifurcation. It's behaving very similarly than uh, the other cell. And uh, again, what we see is that the, uh, when the two arms, one arm retract, the difference between the length of the two arms is very, very small. So this difference is amplified by uh, the actomyosin, uh, the contractility of the actomyosin system. And one of the prediction of the model, so all this is in symmetric bifurcation. So this is just explaining why a cell, the cell, when it's facing a Y-shaped bifurcation, it's choosing preferentially one path. In that case, it's random. So what happens now if the cell is in front of an open end versus a, a, a dead end? So what the model predicts is that the fact that the arm that is in front of the dead ends will retract first, it's because actin accumulates in this arm earlier. Okay. And this is what the, 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 the simulated uh, experiment, so it's not an experiment, simulated, uh, the theoretical cell, so you see actin that is accumulating slightly before in the arm that is facing the dead end, and these are uh, the experiments uh, that are observed of the dendritic cells that choose the low resistant pass. Indeed, we observe that actin accumulates earlier in the losing arm when this one is facing a dead end. Why? What's happened? Huh? You don't believe? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> you have a question? A linguist. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it took us a second to figure out this. the spelling. Lo loser. Lose. It's okay. It's loose. Ah. Loose like losing arm. arm. It's not losing of Stop. losing, but it's losing of losing. You ah, yes. <laughs> I think the audience behave. <laughs> <laughs> it's his fault. Okay. <laughs> ah, it's not the loser arm, it's the losing arm. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> okay, another prediction is, of course, the more permeation increases and the less uh, cells, uh, I mean, the more cells are, are, are biased. And this is predicted by the model and it's also observed in the experiments as I, I showed at the very beginning. So the model basically reproduces uh, quite well the result and suggests that uh, barotaxis, it's a, it's a simple uh, mechanism. It just results from the opposing forces that the uh, fluid is exerting on a cell. It doesn't require, it's something passive, it doesn't require receptor or signaling pathway. So the very last point I'd like to discuss is that, uh, as we said, the cells, when they become mature, they are uh, down-regulating macropinocytosis. So now they are biased by extracellular pressure. <laughs> Does this uh, help them uh, finding their way when they're migrating from the tissue to the lymph node, for example, through the lymphatic networks of, of, uh, of tissues, as I already shown. So this is the, the lymphatic network. As I said, it's quite uh, complicated. It's made of uh, dead ends, uh, smaller vessels than others, etc. So uh, we had experimental data with using this mutant. We had published those data already in, 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 in 2008, I think. Using this mutant, catepsin S knockout, that then does not downregulate macropinocytosis after maturation. And we had found that this mutant takes uh, much longer to arrive to lymph nodes. So we thought, okay, maybe this experimental evidence could be explained uh, by the fact that those cells, because they don't, they keep doing macropinocytosis, they are not guided by extracellular pressure. So we did this, uh, this uh, simulation. Now the cells are put into this labir the lab labyrinth and we look at the path, the length of the path, uh, whether they are uh, macropinocytic or whether they are not. So 
the cells that are macropinocytic are not barotactic and vice versa. And what you can see is that when macropinocytosis is on, uh, the red shows the coverage, uh, they will cover pretty much all the, all the labyrinth. So these cells will be good at patrolling and searching for potential microbes, but they will not be good at finding the exit of the labyrinth. And this, uh, uh, of course, is uh, the opposite when macropinocytosis is off. Now the cells are not good at finding uh, anything in the labyrinth, However, they're very good at finding the exit, so they take the shortest path to find the exit. So we think that uh, this might explain this experimental evidence we had obtained many t 10 years ago and uh, suggest that downregulation of macropinocytosis in the mature cells uh, guides them uh, to lymph node. And uh, this is the conclusion for the model. The model reproduces the role of macropinocytosis in limiting barotaxis, uh, the role of barotaxin in guiding migrating cell, it explains barotaxy as a passive mechanism, no need of receptor or signaling pathway. And uh, um, it shows that hydraulic resistance might be guiding cells by imposing simply an opposing force to migration. And it, in general, explains how cells choose a direction through this amplification uh, mechanisms due to the polarization of the actomyosin network. And the take-home message is that there are physical property of the microenvironment of moving cells. Here I, we show one example, but there are many other physical uh, cues uh, that uh, prevent the migration of cells in tissue, and there are not a lot studied actually. So the example here of hydraulic resistance, but uh, we show also that some cells, at least immune cells, that really need to travel from tissue to tissue, they have developed specific mechanism, in that case macropinocytosis, to diminish the influence of this bias. And uh, we think that this uh, is what makes them efficient reaching their final uh, destination and achieving their, their function as immune sentinel. And with this, I'll close the talk. I was exactly when I, 55 minutes. Um, so the, the person who did most of the experimental work is Hélène Moreau. She's a postdoc in, me, in my lab. And Mathieu Morin helped a lot with image analysis. Um, this is a close collaboration with uh, uh, Mathieu Piel and Raphael Voiturier. In Mathieu Piel lab, Raphael and Atia uh, took care of all the microfluidic devices, built all the microfluidic devices, and also helped for some experiments. And uh, together with Raphael Voiturier and Jean-François Joanny, Carles blanc mercader was really the person who uh, uh, took care of all the theoretical parts. And we thank also many people uh, for providing uh, mice and, and regions. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you think you this, these questions? hydrodynamic effects might also um, help distribute the cells within the network? Because I was thinking when two cells get close, they yes. will, especially if they're yes. approaching the same network. Yes, yes, they will, they, will, they, will, they will repel. Yes, it could perfectly explain also some repulsive effects that are observed in vivo of cells or of pieces of cells. For example, in the brain, there's the neurons that can repel. Of course, there are molecules that have been shown to be involved with this, but this doesn't mean that the physics Physical parameters uh, do not uh, do not play a role as well. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 in the model you presented, so there, there, is there a difference because uh, between the case where you have this macropinocytosis where acting is in the front, or at least spend a lot of time in the front, and the case where you have none, so basically no permeation in the model, and, yeah. and, and actin is in the back to yes. push the cell. So I mean, is it is it pres is this kind of a distribution of actin present in the model? I think that yes, but I would need to verify. Yes, I would need to verify. The same way. I mean, somehow if you pro project, at the same time you, you project the membrane and, and the cell. So the, the, the front membrane doesn't help forward yes. movement, never. So this we really explore because it was our hypothesis at the very beginning. And the front of the cell does not allow movement. The movement is always generated by this actomyosin structure at the back. There's flow of myosin too towards the back. There's this weird, like stellar, like star-like structure of actin cables, and this is on which my myosin is working. This is what generates the movement, even in the macropinocytic and non-macropinocytic cells, in dendritic cells. But then the rest, what you say is if you have more in the, in the front, you have less. Yes, because then you have the competition between the different actomyosin pool. But the movement at the front is never generated. It decreases movement because the, uh, the machine is, uh, is being recruited there. Miguel has a question. So in vivo, is there a pressure gradient 
from the tissue to the lymph node? <laughs> this is a great question I would like to answer, but there's no tool. So uh, I, I, I'm trying to convince uh, physicists to really develop tools to do this. But for now, they don't know how to do it. So if you take the lymphatic and you do theoretical measurement, uh, Yes, there are gradients, I don't know, but there are differences in hydraulic resistance uh, uh, that are supposed to exist, yes. But experimental data do not, <laughs> are lacking. So I hope one day we'll, able to, we'll be able to do this. Yeah, okay. So if I understand the model, uh, the cell fills with its own volume completely the channel, yes. right? And the reason it can't move in a dead-end uh, channel is because it cannot push the fluid in front of itself yes. because there is a... And the fluid is not compressible, yes. So it's very simple. And then, <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, it's clear. And then comes uh, micropinocytosis, which engulfs volume and allows... It. So if the model is correct, the amount of fluid engulfed by the cell, by micropinocytosis, should correspond exactly with the amount displaced during the movement. So that, that would allow a, a quantitative measure, test yes. of, of the microphones at this moment, just yes. measuring exactly. You're completely right. right. <laughs> we haven't been able to measure this because of experimental issue, but you're completely right. And this is, so we're setting up a system where, the problem is the Y-shaped channel. It's, uh, it, to measure this, we need to add some fluorescence once the cells are already, uh, or get, just get into the channel. And this cannot be done in the Y-shaped channel. So what we're going to do, we're trying to do is to have channels where the cells get in and we apply pressure in a dynamic way or in a static way while the cells are already mi migrating. And this would help so us why are you answer this. Fluorescent markers to one of the channels for the problem to make fluorescent markers. No, we uh, we have fluorescent markers, but we cannot add them at the at the precise time then the cells get into the dead end arm. And so what happened? The cells, while it's getting into the towards the bifurcation, it has already engulfed a lot of material. It's already red, and we cannot measure the difference with what it is engulfing when it's running in the closed arm. Uh, and also, if you make an elastic dead end an elastic one, you should be able to measure the force against which the cell is able to push. If you make it, you mean with a soft uh, material? Yes, it's not easy neither. So we've, we've tried for many years to use uh, acrylamide to vary the, the stiffness of the, of the walls and it has been a failure. You know why? Because cells, dendritic cells, they, they, they put a little protrusions below and they they push the acrylamide, so then they go below. They don't follow the channel anymore. Now we're trying with soft PDMS, but I've not seen uh, yet some good result. But this is a good point. But like in fluorescence, you just decay with time. If you adjust time to the speed of the cell, you see pretty exactly how it moves. In fluorescence, but the fluorescence decays with time. And you adjust the rest fluorescent markers, which de allow it decays. And then you see exactly how it develops. But here what we would like to see is the volume, calculate the volume exactly of that you know is... The rate of decay, the rate of movement, you can compute. Yeah. Yeah. You could use a fluorophore that can be switched on by light. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. this could be another way exactly. to use a fluorophore, yes. No, this, this, uh, this, is, this is possible. It's, all, it's only, it's re, it requires yeah. some setting up. Nothing is easy <laughs> in this system. Two more questions, so here. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Macropinocytosis is not always occurring in cancer cells. It is yeah. induced by oncogenic factors. Like yes. So I wonder what is the signaling pathway in dendritic cells yes. that will uh, promote uh, uh, macropinocytosis? It's an open question. I, I keep writing a grant to try to understand this, but I never get it, so <laughs> I haven't managed to start this. So uh, KRAS is probably constitutively active no, because you need it to, to make... Uh, uh, no, KRAS is in general involved in dictyostelium. It's very well shown in the formation of micro... I mean, RAS, it's when it gets activated, it f it's, it's, uh, uh, forms these circular patches from which the circular ruffles build and close and form the micropinosome. Why is this pathway constitutive in dendritic cells? It's not known. Uh, it's not known whether this is, there's some specific physical, biophysical property of the membrane that are associated to this. It's a it's very understudy process. Last question, Amir, and then we're that coffee. Um, I think I'm a little bit confused about this Y-chamber yeah. experimental system with the cells, because 
If you have macropinocytosis and you lose the bare taxis, wouldn't the cells just move backwards also? So cells never move backward. I mean, never. I'm exaggerating. But most of the time, they don't move backward in the microchannel. Why is this? So we explained this in a, in a, in a paper we published in 2015. Um, so uh, this is because there's a, a correlation very good correlation between speed and persistency uh, through uh, a mechanism that is self-sustained. Uh, so the, most, the faster the cells go, the most persistent they reach, and this is due to the flow of actin that uh, is uh, transporting the factors that stabilize the cell polarity towards the back. So the faster the cell goes, the faster is the flow, and the more polarity factors arrive at the back, and the more stable is the polarity of the cell, so it is more persistent. And this is the loop that uh, uh, explains why most of the time the cells, unless they find a f a, a, an obstacle that uh, reverse uh, this, uh, this machinery and these mechanisms, they keep going forward. They don't go back. Most of the time they don't. Actually, when we started looking very carefully in the movies, we found that almost every time when the cells choose direction, it's because there's some impurity on some little thing in the channels that uh, had them uh, slowing down and stopping before going back. So if you want, I can give you the reference of, of that paper. Well, let's thank Anne-Maria and...